scripture this morning is taken from Exodus chapter 20, Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You have no other gods, be you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your, vain, your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is, in, who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not, shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover, covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Thank you, brother, so much. And it's so good to be with you all this morning. And we saw there, and heard, rather, and you were following along, you saw, uh, what uh, we understand to be the Ten Commandments. And... Something that is certainly a bedrock of legal, secular law. It is something that is recognized uh, throughout our country and something that uh, many people throughout the world acknowledge as being uh, clearly uh, beneficial to mankind in all respects and of all classes and types of people. Uh, it is a, a law that is uh, one that we are going to study this, this morning, we're going to consider and contemplate in view not only of the immediate context, but also in view of the Bible as a whole, as we contemplate and consider the New Testament Scriptures, and really where the old law, where the law of Moses, where the Ten Commandments uh, fits in relation to the New Testament. And then also we're going to contemplate and consider uh, various false teachings and uh, groups of folks who have different kinds of beliefs concerning the Ten Comm Commandments. Uh, and the Old Testament law. Uh, but before we do that, a few announcements and considerations. I uh, want uh, folks to, to realize and remember, you do have an announcement in your bulletin in this regard, but March 30th, we're going to meet uh, at Carolyn, Carolyn McFerrin's house, and it's an opportunity for us to uh, serve and help out there. She has several things that need to be taken care of around her property, and so I look forward to uh, doing that and taking the children along with me, Lord willing, and hopefully uh, you can make plans to do that as well. We could use some hands and some help. Uh, so uh, please keep that in mind, and also uh, take note of the several prayer requests that we have uh, in our bulletin and other announcements and upcoming events that we have uh, in store that's uh, announced there, uh, there in our bulletin. Uh, what are we going to consider here in Exodus chapter 20? Well, let's begin by noticing the paradigm. Let's begin by noticing the paradigm. In other words, the pattern, the way in which God set forth these commandments here, verses 1 through 17. If you, if you realize and notice... Uh, there are a couple things that we can take away. Number one, many of the commandments provided here are of, of a negative context, of a negative context. Thou shalt not, or thou shalt have no, uh, God states over and over again. As a matter of fact, eight of the ten are from a negative perspective. What we, uh, as we think about the children of Israel as they were being commanded these various laws, what they should not have been doing or engaging in. Uh, there's also two positive uh, commandments. You see there verses 8 through uh, 11, 8 through 11, and then verse 12 as well. Uh, keeping the Sabbath day and honoring thy father and thy mother. This is not out of step at all 
in regards to how God usually delivers His commandments and His law. Notice with me in the New Testament, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, what we're studying in our Wednesday evening Bible class together in the auditorium. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning there verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. And so once again, in the New Testament era, God is delivering his word, he's delivering his doctrine. And in doing so, as it is preached, as it is taught, there's a lot of negative teaching that takes place, reproving and rebuking, and also some positive teaching, exhortation. Uh, the same is true regarding the prophets. Look with me in Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, notice here uh, in verses 9 and 10, verses 9 and 10 of Jeremiah chapter 1, Then the Lord put forth His hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Uh, very similar to the parallel there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Now notice here the similarities between 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Verse 10 here, See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. And so once again, you have a lot of negative based Works a lot of negative based teaching or commandments concerning how God's word was going to be delivered and the outcome of his word being delivered. Destruction is going to take place. Pulling down is going to take place. Rooting out is going to take place. Throwing down is going to take place. But also there's exhortation or there's encouragement or there's positive based commandments as well. And so you see in the giving of the Ten Commandments, as we call them here in Exodus chapter 20, that the paradigm provides us a pattern that is similar to the pattern given by God throughout the Bible, in the prophets, and even in the New Testament. But notice also the different types of commands concerning uh, the people. Uh, there are commandments being given regarding mankind and his relationship with God, especially there if you notice <clears throat> the, first, uh, the first several commandments, verses uh, 1 through uh, 11, 1 through 11, and then God gives several other commandments regarding mankind and his relationship with his fellow man. Honor thy father and mother, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, and so forth. And so you have then uh, six commandments dealing with mankind and his relationship with one another, and you have four major commandments dealing with mankind and his relationship and interaction with God. And so uh, we see the paradigm, we see how it relates to the way in which God delivered his law holistically throughout the scriptures, but also notice the context here and the, uh, the pattern, the paradigm of the del delivery of this law in relation to God's people and what's going on. They have recently been pulled out of slavery. They've recently been delivered by the servant Moses. Uh, God had called Moses to the mount, as we see there, verses 20 through 25. Moses then goes back down unto the people. God then continues to speak unto Moses up into the mount, uh, chapters 21, all the way through chapter 31. At the end there of verse, uh, in chapter 31 and verse 18, we see then that he gives unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony tables of stone written with the finger of God. And so God then delivers this law, provides it unto Moses. Moses then was up in the mount. He comes down from the mount, and upon coming down after having communed with God, after having been given this law, what does Moses then find before him? Well, the people seem to be doing uh, the very opposite of what they were supposed to be doing according to the commandments that they had just received from the Lord. Now sometimes we might say, well, the people didn't know the Ten Commandments yet. Moses hadn't come down. No, no, go back with me to Exodus chapter 20. And notice once again in verse 25 in Exodus 19, Moses had come down unto the people and spake unto them. Verse 1, and God spake all these words, saying, notice that in verse 18, and all the people saw the thundering 
and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpets and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they were moved and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. And so these people had been given the Ten Commandments. They had received, they had heard the law of God. And as Moses then is receiving uh, the totality of these commandments as it's being written on two tables of stone, what are the people doing in the process? They're violating the very paradigm, the very pattern, the very commands that God had just provided to them. Now why might they have done this? And what is another interesting point that we can take away regarding this paradigm? Well, think about the final commandment of the Ten Commandments in relation to <clears throat> mankind and his interaction with his fellow man. Notice there in verse 17, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet, covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Covetousness, in many regards, has a relation to all the previous nine commandments here in the Ten Commandments. Because as someone is seeking and coveting that which is not his own, what is he willing to do in order to get it? Well, just about anything. Willing to violate the commandments of God. Violate his own relationship with God. Throw it all away, cast it all away, so that he can be like unto those that are around him. God's people had this issue throughout time. They had this issue as the Ten Commandments, as these two tables of stone are literally being written and formulated, they are seeking to be like those that were around them back in Egypt, so making two calves of gold, making uh, uh, idols and worshiping and bowing down unto them, making uh, the calf of gold. And so uh, that did not cease there, unfortunately, in the book of Exodus, this yearning and desire to be like those around them. We see even in 1 Samuel chapter 8, 1 Samuel chapter 8, Israel is demanding a king. They want someone to rule over them. Why do they want someone to rule over them? Verse 5 of 1 Samuel chapter 8, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Samuel, we don't want anything to do with you. We're tired of you delivering unto us the commandments and the instruction and the reminders that are being provided via God. We don't want God to be our king. We want an earthly king. We covet the nations that are around us and we desire to be just like them. And so God will go on and say, uh, no, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me from being their king. Verse 7. See, covetousness. That last command there in the Ten Commandments, verse 17 of Exodus chapter 20, sometimes we just kind of throw it away and we don't recognize how it relates and correlates to so many more of the commandments, not only here in the Ten Commandments, but also throughout the Scriptures. You might say, well, how does covetousness really have anything to do with making graven images? How does covetousness really have anything to do with uh, not putting the Lord first and, and serving only Him? Well, Number one, we already saw the outcome there in Exodus chapter 32, the making of the golden calf. But number two, notice what Paul even writes by inspiration in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 writes there, verse 5, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Yes, evil desires you need to be mortifying out of your life. Uh, unclean affection and uncleanness and fornication and all these wicked behaviors. Get rid of it. Root it out of your entire life. And even covetousness. Why? Because it relates to all of those. Covetousness is, by the way, Paul says, idolatry. Why? Because I am now choosing to replace God from the one that I am worshiping, serving, and living for. And putting the image of someone else or some other kind of status or description of life as my purpose for being, as my reason for living and pursuing that which I am pursuing. And so we see here the paradigm in Exodus chapter 20, the paradigm, the negative commands, the positive commands. 
the relationship regarding God's commandments concerning how man is to approach Him and how man is to deal with his fellow man. And then also the relationship between covetousness and the rest of the commandments. But let's also look at the purpose of the Ten Commandments. The purpose of the Ten Commandments. Go with me back to the book of Exodus and look here uh, in Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. And notice here what we see. Notice here what we see. Uh, Moses had broken those tables of stone because of the idolatry that he had seen back there in Exodus chapter 32, 15 through 19. And so uh, chapter 34 then is a second giving then of these tables of stone. And we notice here in verse 29, And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, a hand, when he came down from the mount that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had in Mount Sinai. And Moses, I'm speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. Till Moses was finished speaking, he put a veil on his face. Why? Well, because of his shining face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out, and he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And all the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, and Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. So what's Moses doing? He's going, he's speaking with God, he's receiving these commandments, he received the two tables of stone, once again he comes and delivers it unto the people of Israel. And in the process of doing so, because he was communing and speaking with God, because he's receiving these commandments, his face is shining. And so because his face is shining, then he puts on a veil so that the children of Israel aren't distracted, aren't seeing that shining face, and are receiving then the instructions as provided by God through Moses. Well, how is that relevant? How does this tie in to the purpose of the Ten Commandments? Well, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and notice with me here, verses 7 through 18. This is a longer passage, but bear with me. It details exactly what just took place back there in Exodus 34. Paul here is making a, a comparison to the Old Testament law and the New Testament law to the way in which the two are to be understood, and he's going to use what took place there in Exodus 34 as a teaching moment to make his point by inspiration. There in verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 3. But if the ministration of death, written and engraved in stones, exactly what had taken place back there in Exodus 20 through 34, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For, the, for if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Let's make a comparison. Hey, the New Testament law, as delivered via the Holy Ghost, that we now are receiving, that we're now providing to you, uh, if you thought that it was glorious back there in the Old Testament time when the two tables of stone were delivered, and you consider the shining of Moses' face, then how much more glorious is this law, the New Testament law, that which is being delivered now? Verse, uh, verse 10 there. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. What's he saying there? Well, that which was done away, that which is no longer in effect, that which is no longer in authority is being done away. Then this which you are receiving, the New Testament law, is even more glorious. Verse 12, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. 
See, just like that veil covered up the shining face of Moses. Because they could not steadfastly look upon His face. Because they could not truly understand what the purpose of the Old Testament law, the Ten Commandments, the two tables of stone was all about. So too are they in a state now where that veil still exists. They still don't understand the purpose, the meaning, the reason for the Old Testament law. They're still not able to see that which is glorious. Far more glorious than those two tables of stone. So Paul then goes on and explains. But even, verse 15, unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. They're still blinded. They're still allowing their hearts to be hardened. They're not seeing the purpose of it all. And so, the purpose then of the Old Testament, the purpose then of the Ten Commandments, of those two tables of stone, it was not the end-all, be-all, folks. It was not the most glorious regarding what God was going to provide man. No, that which was most glorious was the coming Christ. The one who did away with that very veil at the end there, verse 14. The Gospel which can be understood, which can save, if they, in this context, would just lift the veil from their hearts. In other words, if they would just allow themselves to see why it is that God chose them. Why it is that they existed as a nation. Why it is that God provided them a land. And protected them and cared for them and had that covenant relationship with them. Why was it so? It was so, so that Jesus Christ could come about and save mankind. Where did Jesus come from? He came from that nation. Why was that nation preserved? Why were they cared for? So that they could continue to exist? So that Jesus Christ could come out of it? Why did Jesus need to come out of it? So that all the nations of the earth could be blessed. Genesis chapter 12 verse 3. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment. The reason for that nation existing. The reason for those two tables of stone. The reason for the Ten Commandments. The reason for the law of Moses. He's the purpose of it all. As a matter of fact, Paul will explain in Romans chapter 10 and verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Jesus explains in Matthew chapter 5 verse 17, think not that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy it, but to fulfill. I've come to now complete it. I now make an end of its existence and reason for being because now I'm here. Now you might say, preacher, why are you explaining all this to us? Number one, folks, this is rich. Now I know I'm nerding it up, but I love, this is incredible, the arguments here that are being made by Paul as he's inspired. Explaining here, hoping that the Jewish people will realize the error of their ways. But number two, what's the applicable benefit for us? How do we understand the Ten Commandments? How do we perceive the Ten Commandments? Well, the secular lawyers of today, and even religious people of today, what will they say? Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments. They'll put literally tables of stone out in their yard. They'll debate and argue and go crazy regarding whether or not Ten Commandments are being shown in front of courthouses, etc., all things from a secular perspective, from a political perspective, we can argue all day long. But folks, here's the point. The Ten Commandments have been fulfilled. The Ten Commandments, in their original purpose, have met their purpose. And now we have the Gospel. Now we have Jesus Christ. Now we live by that which the Ten Commandments was looking forward to, given the shining face of of Moses. And so what then can we consider further regarding the purpose? Well, we can consider our very own perfection. In other words, our desire to mature. You think about that passage we read a few moments ago in 2 Timothy chapter 3 at the 
end there of that passage, verses 16 and 17, why is it that the Scripture has been given? That the man of God may be perfect, that he might be mature in his work for the Lord. Well, sometimes folks say, I want to be mature in my work for the Lord. I want to grow stronger spiritually. And so, in order for me to do so, I need to go out and find all these other regulations and all these other things to add on to my spiritual life so that I can be extra good for God. For example, I need to keep the Sabbath day. I need to observe the law of Moses regarding the eating of certain meats and not eating of certain meats. I need to engage in certain kinds of holy days. We were driving in this morning, passing a sign, and it said, The Passover has begun. Folks, this is a Christian, quote, a Christendom group of people. Talk about the Passover. They're going to observe the Passover. Folks, the Bible is teaching us here what that's all about. We don't see any observance of the Passover, any observance of a holy day, any observance of a, of, a, of a Sabbath or certain regulations regarding our diet in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, Paul explains to the brethren in Colossae in Colossians chapter 2, as they were being tempted by those Jewish Christians, those that were uh, Hebrew in their nationality, who were trying to influence the Gentiles and say, hey, if you really want to be spiritual, you need to add these extra regulations. If you really want to be spiritual, you need to be circumcised. You need to uh, not eat these kinds of meats. You need to observe these holy days. You need to make sure you keep the Sabbath. And so Paul is writing these brethren here in Colossae trying to warn them of this false teaching. And in Colossians chapter 2, he writes there in verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath. Why, Paul? Verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. That's the Old Testament law. You're not supposed to be observing those things. You're not supposed to be paying attention to those things. Don't allow someone to trick you. That was all a shadow of what was going to come. That shadow is Christ. As the Hebrews writer will go on to explain in Hebrews chapter 10, 1 through 4. And so the purpose of the Old Testament law, the purpose of the Ten Commandments, and how that relates to our perfectionism, our maturity in our spirituality, is to use the Old Testament law for our learning, Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. Don't use it for our authority. Don't go and say, well, in the book of Psalms, David's using a harp. Yeah, so you're going to use that as authority in worship for New Testament time? Are you going to also use sacrificing bulls and goats, just as David explains in the book of Psalms? No. So the logic there breaks down. And so perfectionism is not by adding on additional commandments. It's not by going out and finding new laws and, and trying to, to bind things that aren't bound in the New Testament. But it's by living in the scriptures that God's provided according to those scriptures. Now, folks, there are some bodies of people. Uh, and by the way, I just want to say I know that these sermons are recorded. I know that we have visitors from time to time. I know that we have members even that get uncomfortable when we talk about denominational bodies. I understand that. And it would be a shame and wrong for someone to stand up here with a horrible attitude and start making it sound like so-and-so is better than so-and-so. But folks, when we talk about eternal salvation, when we talk about the blind leading the blind that Jesus warns us of, we need to be aware that there are certain folks, their idea of spiritual maturity or perfectionism is to do that which God has us not to do. The very end verses of the book of Revelation tells us not to add to or take away from the Scriptures. It's a principle given throughout the Bible. And yet we have entire bodies of people who have created their own manuals their very own books. This is not a Bible, young people. This is not a Bible, older people. I guess I'm in that category now. This is a manual that is to be followed by a group of people who would claim themselves to be people of God who are telling themselves based upon laws that they have created, regulations that they have created, that things such as the Sabbath day must be followed. 
must be observed. That the Sabbath day must be kept because it's in the Ten Commandments. Well, folks, I don't know about you, but this isn't going to get me to heaven. This right here, following this, is what's going to get me to heaven. This is what's going to judge me. Jesus says in John chapter 12, verse 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word which I have spoken, the same will judge him in the last day. This is not going to judge me. This is. My opinions are not going to judge you. This is. Your ideas, theories, <laughs> desires are not going to judge you. This is. So when we think about the Ten Commandments, and when we think about our desire to grow and perfect and mature spiritually, let us understand where they fit in relation to God's eternal purpose, the church. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Are you here this morning and you're not yet a child of God? You're not yet a member of that church. How do you become a member? Do you get voted in? Do you have people get together in a group and, and agree, hey, they need to be a member, they're a member now. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us that the Lord makes you a member. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. How exactly did that take place? Well, verses 40 and 41, when Peter said, save yourselves from this untoward generation, we then read, those who gladly received His word were baptized. How do I become a member? How do I become saved? I'm baptized into Christ based upon my belief and my confession in Him. We see that exemplified also in Acts chapter 8, 34-39. If you're here tonight and you've yet to become a member of that body, you have the opportunity to do so uh, this morning. If you've fallen away, need prayers of the congregation. We're here to help you in any way that we can. If you have any spiritual need, won't you?